let me uh, give a quick intro to Robert. It's it's really terrific to have you, Robert. Um, um, what a what a cool topic. It's something we've all thought about, imagined. Um, you know, I'm sure it hurts some people's heads. Some people love it. We're all science fiction fans. All of the above, right? So. Um, it's great to have you here. Uh, Robert Noy is a freelance journalist who specializes in science reporting. Um, terrific background. He's been a chief editor of Sky and Telescope magazine. He's, he's worked for Astronomy magazine, Discover. He's done a stint at uh, NASA, I guess, right up, at, uh, right up the beltway from us here at NASA Goddard. Um, I mean, just, just all over the place. And uh, uh, it's great to have you here. And we look forward to your presentation on detecting life beyond Earth, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, guess, great. It's just one reminder for our folks, as we usually do, if you have questions, and, and I'm sure we will, just type them in the chat box, and we'll circle back uh, with Robert towards the end of his presentation. All right, thank you. Okay, well, great. Uh, thank you, Paul. I assume everybody can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, uh, I think we'll get get started then. So I want to thank uh, Paul and I want to thank George uh, Doshek for inviting me and setting up this uh, meeting tonight. <clears throat> and I especially want to thank Novak for hosting the meeting. And it's really great for me to reconnect with the club after several years. I think many of you might know me. I've spoken probably at least five times, maybe six or seven times at the Almost Heaven Star Party. So it's really great to reconnect with the club. And I just want to thank all of you for, uh, for tuning in tonight. Uh, so my talk tonight is going to be based on a cover story I wrote for Astronomy Magazine about a year ago in the September 2020 issue. And then there was also an accompanying web article. So my topic is how scientists are searching for life on other worlds. And scientists want answers to these profound questions about the prevalence and nature of extraterrestrial life. I mean, intellectuals have discussed, you know, these topics for centuries, but the public, you know, even people without any scientific background are interested too. I mean, just think about some of the most popular science mo or movies of all time or things like E.T., Avatar, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, that have a theme of extraterrestrial life. Uh, but despite all of this interest and speculation, this field of astrobiology, the study of life on other worlds, is a science whose subject matter has not been proven to exist. But scientists have good reason to be optimistic that life is common in our galaxy and, and the universe. Uh, one of the reasons for optimism is if you look at the oldest well-preserved rocks on Earth, including these 3.8 billion year old rocks from Greenland, there's chemical evidence in carbon isotope ratios that there was life. And then if you go back about three and a half billion years, there's actually fossilized evidence of microbial life. So we know that life got started on Earth when it was less than one-fifth of its current age. We still don't know how or where life got started, but because it got going so early in our planet's history, it's you know, easy to imagine that life will get started whenever conditions are favorable, you know, meaning the presence of liquid water, organic molecules, and sources of energy. And then another reason for optimism is that our galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 200 billion stars. And we know from surveys of exoplanets, there's an average of at least one planet per star. So we're already talking 200 billion planets. <clears throat> that number could be considerably higher. And then if you factor in moons, we're talking probably at least a trillion or more worlds in our galaxy alone. And then another reason for optimism is we know that stars and planetary systems form inside giant gas clouds like the Orion Nebula seen in this picture. Well, when astronomers uh, take spectra of these clouds, they're just brimming with elements such as carbon, 
hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen that are essential to life on Earth. So, you know, assume, you know, this means that the stuff that we know can make life on at least one planet is widespread and very, very common throughout the galaxy. But I would argue that drawing strong conclusions from just a single phenomenon can be a foolhardy exercise. For example, we cannot right now rule out the possibility that the origin of life on Earth was a once in a universe miracle. Uh, maybe we even got incredibly lucky that as Earth was undergoing profound changes and it's, you know, uh, uh, atmospheric chemistry, surface temperature and conditions, continents moving around, that Earth has maintained life for three and a half billion years. Maybe that's very rare. Uh, and we also don't know if it's common for, let's say, millions and millions of planets start off with microbial life. But for all we know, maybe Earth is the only planet where that simple one cell unicellular microbial life eventually evolved to produce very complex plant and animal life. We don't know whether that's typical or atypical. So by just studying life on Earth, we can't answer these questions. We have to find life elsewhere. So as my astronomy article explains, <clears throat> scientists are taking three different roads or approaches to search for extraterrestrial life. So imagine this road on the left is exploring the solar system with robotic probes, maybe eventually sending people out there. Number two is using large telescopes to probe the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars to search for what I will be calling biosignatures. So, so these are exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than the sun. And then last, and but certainly not least, is the search for techno signatures from advanced civilizations and also doing what's called SETI. So this is not a race or competition. We don't know how common life is or the range of environments in which it could thrive. So it's really impossible to predict how soon we will make the first detection of life on another world or how we will make that detection. So I like the fact there's different approaches. We're not putting all of our eggs in one basket. So because we don't know who or what is out there, you know, we need to just observe and explore. So that's what I'll be discussing over the next half hour, 40 minutes or so. So I wanna start off in our solar system. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, didn't astronomers recently announce the discovery of life on Venus? And if you're thinking that you have a good memory because last September, an international team, mostly British and American astronomers, announced that it had used radio telescopes in Hawaii and Chile to detect the molecule phosphine in Venus's thick atmosphere. So we can see here at the bottom right, phosphine is a molecule containing three atoms of hydrogen and one of phosphorus. Now the phosphine in Earth's atmosphere comes from biological or industrial processes. So finding this on another, you know, Earth-sized planet is an intriguing discovery. And this slide superposed on the image of Venus, you see the two spectra, the one from Hawaii in white, the one from Chile in blue. Uh, but the problem is that other teams have since tried to replicate this finding and have not detected phosphine, even the original discovery team has gone back and looked at its data and found that the signal is much weaker uh, than they originally uh, announced. So from, you know, it's still very dicey whether they've actually detected phosphine. Um, and, you know, we don't even know, even if it is phosphine, whether it was produced by Venus microbes or something else. So I think this claim it's not completely gone, but in my opinion, it's not a very convincing claim for life on another world. So I now want to turn my attention to the next planet out, which of course is Mars. And as all of you know, Mars periodically comes fairly close to Earth. 
and it makes it relatively easy to observe and reach with spacecraft. So for many centuries, many people naively assumed that Mars was once inhabited by abundant vegetation or even a civilization. But NASA spacecraft visits to Mars in the late 1960s and early 1970s disabused humanity of those ideas. So we, you know, we got great orbiter photos like these two photos from Viking, and they revealed that the Martian surface is cold, dry, barren, and lacking any obvious signs for life, like no forests or any sign of vegetation whatsoever. But if you'll notice in both of these orbiter photos, you look, you can see channels, uh, complex channels that look very much like uh, you know, like those carved by streams and rivers on Earth. And more recent exploration from the surface by NASA rovers, especially Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity, they have demonstrated beyond all doubt that liquid water once flowed across Mars billions of years ago. So there was water on the surface long ago that has since dried up, but perhaps... There was life on Mars long ago. Maybe it retreated underground when the planet lost its once thick atmosphere. And then, you know, as the surface dried up, there's still life there, but it's just underground. So to test that idea, uh, in 1976, NASA landed two Viking spacecraft on Mars, Viking 1 and Viking 2. They're on opposite sides of the planet. These were the first successful landings on Mars. I remember I was uh, 13 years old at the time, and I was like just blown away by this, that we could land robotic probes on another planet. So on the left, we see a model of one of these Viking landers, and on the right is an image taking, taken from Viking 1. And if you're curious, that big rock there is called Big Joe, and it's a good thing Viking 1 did not come down right on Big Joe, or that would have been the end of the mission. Now, both spacecraft carried mechanical arms that could literally scoop up soil samples and bring this Martian material inside the lander. You can see some trenches here from this mechanical arm. Um, each lander carried three experiments to analyze this Martian dirt to see if it contains microbes that metabolize various organic nutrients and then release gas <clears throat> or other waste products. Now, interestingly, uh, <clears throat> one of the biology experiments returned positive results for life at both sites on opposite sides of the planet, 4,000 miles apart. But most scientists conclude that this experiment did not detect metabolizing Martian microbes, but instead just some kind of one kind of active chemical agent in the Martian soil. So this result still controversial to this day. Uh, there's still scientists who think that NASA discovered life on Mars back in 1976, but most scientists think that is unlikely. Uh, I, you know, I, what I would say is, I'm disappointed that NASA has never sent a dedicated life detection experiment to Mars to follow up these tantalizing results. Uh, then there are other hints of possible life on Mars, past and present. I'm sure many of you remember in 1996, NASA held a big press conference that included President Clinton announcing that they had found signs of life inside a Martian meteorite named ALH84001. I'm not going to quiz you on that, uh, so don't worry about that. So there was a team of NASA and Stanford scientists that, that argued that they had found chemical indications of, of life inside this rock. And possibly, as you can see on the right, even uh, microscopic images of fossilized nanobacteria. Now, this life would have dated back billions of years, back to when Mars was warmer and wetter, 
But these claims also remain controversial because all of the signs for life can be replicated by no non-biological, you know, chemical and geological processes. Now, more recently, and I would argue more intriguingly, telescopic observations from Earth and measurements from the surface from NASA's Curiosity rover have detected trace levels of methane uh, in the Mar Mars's thin atmosphere. And as you can see in this illustration, the methane rises in the spring and summer, you know, peaks in the late summer, and then plummets into the autumn and winter. And then it repeats that cycle year after year. Of course, a Mars year is about almost two Earth years. Uh, now on Earth, about 95% of the methane in our atmosphere has a biological origin. So the problem is, you know, where does this methane on Mars come from? We don't really know because there are non-biological processes that could produce methane on Mars. So we don't know where it comes from. This is a riddle that remains unsolved. Even more intriguing, about two years ago, NASA announced that Curiosity had detected trace levels of molecular oxygen. That's oxygen two. That's the oxygen that all of us are breathing right now as I give this talk. And just like the methane, the oxygen rises and falls with the season, pretty much in tandem with the methane. Um, you know, the amount in the summer is a lot more than what scientists would expect, breakdown of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which of course is a molecule that contains oxygen. Um, so it remains, again, unclear whether this oxygen is the result of chemistry or biology. But the key point here is that we might have already detected biosignatures on Mars, but we don't yet have proof that it comes from life. Now, I'm sure all of you know that just a few months ago on February 18th of this year, NASA landed, safely landed its latest rover called Perseverance or Percy for short. I'm going to call it Percy. And here we see a spectacular image taken from Percy. Now, Percy touched down in Jezero Crater, and this is an orbiter picture of Jezero Crater. And you can see here what it is. It's an ancient river delta. So Percy should find plenty of rocks that formed in liquid water. So NASA is touting Percy as a life-finding mission. But in reality, this is the truth, Percy doesn't really carry any instruments that are really designed to detect microscopic life. I mean, it's conceivable that it could detect minerals that formed in the presence of life. It could find like, like fossilized life that you can see with its cameras. But it's, you know, in my view, it's not really a life-finding mission. I would argue with that. Um, but more important though, and this is where the life does come into play, it's going to collect rock and soil samples for later return to Earth. And I'm gonna to return to that shortly. In the meantime, the European Space Agency, or ESA, is planning its own Mars rover named Rosalind Franklin after the great British scientist whose X-ray imaging in the 1950s made possible James Watson and Francis Crick's 1953 discovery of DNA's double helix structure. Uh, she didn't get the credit she deserved in her short life, but she does get the credit she deserves now. Now, this rover was originally scheduled to launch last year, but they ran into trouble testing its parachutes, and then the pandemic hit, which really kind of threw their plans out of whack. So ESA has postponed the launch until late next year. But if all goes according to plan, that blue dot with the arrow, that's where Rosalind Franklin is gonna land, in an ancient Martian lake bed known as Oxia Planum. And this site was chosen because of its high potential 
for the preservation of ancient rocks formed in liquid water. Now, this rover is going to carry a suite of cameras, scientific instruments, and most important, a drill. The cameras are going to look for, you know, signatures of past biological activity and the textures of rock, you know, things maybe like fossilized stromatolites or stuff like that. Uh, but although such structures have not been seen to date by NASA's landers and rovers, but I think what's really cool is this drill is going to bring up material from two meters, that's over six feet, below the surface. This is the deepest drill ever sent to Mars. And at that depth, the Martian material is protected from the ravages of solar ultraviolet radi radiation and surface oxidation. So it's going to bring up this material from two, you know, two meters below the surface, bring it on board. There's a laboratory there that will crush the material into a powder and then heat it. And then it has a laser spectrometer and a mass spectrometer that's going to analyze the release gas for signs of organic compounds and a variety of biosignatures of past or current life. So if there is life near the Martian surface, there's a good chance that ESA will be NASA to the punch. But I mentioned a couple minutes ago that Percy will be collecting samples for later return to Earth. So uh, and ESA and NASA are planning a joint mission to return those samples to Earth in the early 2030s, maybe about a decade from now. So in the words of Percy science team member Jim Bell of Arizona State University, the rover's mission will not be complete until its samples are brought back to Earth. Now, the plan right now is that NASA will provide the fetch vehicle uh, that will collect the, the rock and soil samples. <clears throat> and then ESA will pr provide the spacecraft that will launch them off the surface of Mars or uh, yeah, launch them off uh, or NASA will launch them off Mars. And then ESA will have a vehicle that will rendezvous in orbit and return the samples to Earth. Now, this is obviously a very technologically challenging mission, but if it works, we'll have Martian samples collected from a known location on Mars, which can then scientists can then study in the very best laboratories on Earth. So this analysis will reveal, resolve the life question if scientists find living or fossilized microbes. Now, I, I thought you'd all get a little laugh out of this cartoon here, which was from several years ago. Um, if any of these mi upcoming missions find evidence of life on Mars, despite what's implied by this cartoon, it would be an incredible discovery. Um, if this life has some kind of evolutionary linkage to terrestrial life, it would imply that life originated on one planet and was transported to the other inside a meteorite, like ALH 84001 that I showed you a few minutes ago. Or it could imply that life originated somewhere else and Earth and Mars were seeded with life from a common outside source. But let's say the Mars life, let's say they find microbes and it doesn't have DNA or it has a different biochemistry, you know, really different kind of life. That would it suggest that life arose independently on two separate worlds. Now, if you have two worlds orbiting one star, the sun, and we've got billions of worlds, almost, you know, I'm sure many of them have liquid water and energy and organic compounds, finding that life originated independently on two different worlds orbiting the sun, I think would imply that there are probably billions of worlds in our galaxy alone that have at least some kind of primitive life. That would be an incredible uh, discovery. Uh, I just want to mention briefly before I move on is that the icy moons of the outer solar system are also potential abodes for life. The prime candidates are shown here, Europa, a moon of Jupiter, 
and then Enceladus and Titan, which are moons of Saturn. Um, we know that these worlds have oceans containing large quantities of liquid water lurking under their icy surfaces. So NASA is currently developing a Jupiter orbiter that will fly by Europa dozens of times to give us more understanding of its biological potential. And I think one of the, the coolest missions is that NASA is even developing a helicopter mission called Dragonfly to uh, fly in the atmosphere of Titan sometime in the next decade or two. So I think in the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to learn a lot more about the potential of these icy worlds in the outer solar system to support life. But I don't think we're going to discover life at least for the next 10 or 20 years on these worlds. So I want to take a quick sip of water. And now I, it's time to leave our solar system behind and turn to exoplanets. Now I checked the website exoplanet.eu, that's the extrasolar encyclopedia, and as of just a few hours ago, astronomers have found 4,785 exoplanets. That is nearly 600 times as many planets as we have found orbiting the sun. So as I mentioned earlier, our galaxy has hundreds of billions of planets, maybe as many as a trillion, but even the closest of these worlds is 4.2 light years away. That's 25 trillion miles. So we're not gonna be visiting them anytime soon. So many of, many of you might be wondering, how can we study them for signs of life? Well, the easiest exoplanets to study with current technology are those whose orbits line up with our line of sight so that the planet crosses in front of the star, its host star, every time it goes around. So astronomers call this crossing event a transit. And of course, in the solar system, we see transits of Mercury and Venus. Uh, now, as the planet uh, crosses the face of its star, you can see the graph here at the bottom, the planet drop, you know, blocks like one or two percent of the star's light. So astronomers notice a very slight dip in the star's light. So if you see this signature repeat over and over, you, you discover the planet, you can get a good estimate of its diameter, and you can also tell how far away it is from the star, and you know, uh, which tells you, you know, what, what its conditions might be like. So as these planets transit their stars, some of this star's light passes through the upper atmosphere of the planet's atmosphere, assuming it's not just barren rock and metal. Now, as this illustration shows, atoms and molecules in the planet's upper atmosphere will absorb or deflect some of the star's light, making it fainter at specific wavelengths. So astronomers can take a spectra of the star when the planet is in transit and when the planet is out of transit. And when the planet is in transit, astronomers will see additional spectral lines and the star spectrum and those lines, these dark lines, which can then be plotted on a graph, uh, act like fingerprints, basically revealing elements and molecules in the planet's atmosphere. So these spectral lines could reveal potential biospheres like the phosphine on Venus or the methane and oxygen on Mars. Now, if alien astronomers, let's say with, on a planet a few dozen light years away, have really good telescopes like the ones we might have fairly soon, and they've been able to take high resolution spectrum of a spectra of Earth, this is what they would see. Now, there's very strong spectral lines for oxygen, both oxygen two and O3, which is ozone. They would see water vapor, carbon dioxide and methane, and that would absolutely catch their attention in a big way. 
oxygen is a highly reactive element, so it would not remain in Earth's atmosphere unless it were constantly being replenished. And on Earth, what is replenishing the oxygen? Well, it's photosynthesis, a you know, very, very important biological process. So see, you know, the astron alien astronomers would see there's a lot of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere, but they would also see it in combination with water vapor, CO2, methane. They would conclude that there is a very high probability that there is life on this planet. In fact, they would probably conclude correctly that there is a lot of life here, a very, very rich, thriving biosphere. So we're going to be taking spectra like this of other planets or trying to get spectra this good eventually, looking for these types of chemical indicators, you know, looking for things like oxygen, but especially looking for what is called disequilibrium chemistry, where you see combinations of molecules that should not coexist in a planetary atmosphere unless they're being constantly being replenished by, by life. Now, astronomers have already used this transit spectroscopy method to discover dozens of different chemicals in exoplanet atmospheres, including things like water vapor and carbon dioxide. But it's generally thought that it will require next generation telescopes to find the really more difficult to detect biosignatures. The good news is that these next gen telescopes are just around the corner. Later this year, a European space agency, Ariane 5 rocket is gonna launch NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, which is gonna have a 6.5 meter primary mirror that's more than double Hubble's 2.4 meter mirror. And it's gonna be optimized uh, for infrared observations. So it can reveal stuff like water, ozone, methane, and carbon dioxide in exoplanet atmospheres. It's gonna concentrate on stars within a few dozen light years of Earth that are known to have transiting planets. And they're especially gonna concentrate on the planets that orbit within the star's habitable zones, you know, which are the zones where life is considered to be most likely because there could be the right temperatures and atmospheric conditions for liquid water uh, on the surface. But it's not just the James Webb Space Telescope. International consortiums are currently building three gigantic land-based telescopes pictured here the 30-meter telescope, the giant Magellan telescope, and the European extremely large telescope, these things are behemoths. They're going to dwarf all current land-based optical telescopes. They have primary mirrors 20 to 25 to 40 meters in diameter, and they're going to be equipped with the state-of-the-art instruments. So they're going to be able to probe a much larger number of, of exoplanets and, and to do so with even better spectral resolution than James Webb. And because of their location on Earth's surface, they're going to be mainly optimized for visible light observations, which will be good for things like detecting oxygen and water. I think the bottom line is this. If life is common in the galaxy, where you know there's a you know, very significant percentage of planets, you know, have some form of life. There's a good chance we're going to define this out within the next ten years, thanks to Jeb Webb, James Webb, and these three giant space uh, ground-based telescopes. Astronomers are also developing technologies that will use advanced coronagraphs and other techniques to block out the light of host stars that have planets. The problem, of course, in studying exoplanets is the star will typically outshine a planet depending on the various factors and wavelength by roughly a million to one. So it's really hard to study the planet when it's it kind of lost in the, the glare of, the, of a, you know, a much brighter star. 
But astronomers, by canceling out the light of the star, it makes it much easier to, to study the planet. So there's an international team that right now is working on the technology for what they call ExoLife Finder or ELF. This would be a 20 to 30 meter uh, ground-based telescope um, that will really be able to probe deep into exoplanet atmospheres and even take images of the, pla of the planet's surface, including it could image oceans and continents and even cloud formations. Uh, and this thing will be able to also study planets that don't transit their stars. And that's the vast majority of planets uh, in our galaxy that they, we don't see them transit. Now, to get the very best possible exoplanet data, astronomers hope someday to launch a really large space telescope that's really optimized for exoplanet studies. There's one on the drawing board right now called Louvoir that would be somewhere between 8 and 15 meters, depending on funding. But this thing is probably at least a decade away. When and Whether and when it gets built is going to depend more on politics and funding. You know, the astronomers could build it, but you got to give them the money to do that. It might largely depend on how successful a uh, James Webb Space Telescope is. But I would love to see this thing launch in my lifetime. Okay, I'm now going to go after another hit of water. I'm going to get to the final and what I think is the most fun part of the talk, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI for short. But I'm also going to discuss techno signatures which are signs of advanced civilizations that are modifying their planets or space environments in ways that our advanced telescopes could detect. Now, since the early 1960s, astronomers have been using radio telescopes and arrays, such as the Allen Telescope Array in California, seen here, uh, to search for radio signals from advanced civilizations. I do want to stress that SETI, though, is only a very minor part of what astro radio astronomers do. It's actually a very minor branch of ra radio astronomy, although it gets a lot of attention in the public. But in recent years, SETI projects have often piggybacked on radio observations of normal astronomical sources, such as stars, pulsars, and galaxies. Now, the most advanced SETI projects project right now is called Breakthrough Listen, funded by this tech billionaire at the upper left named Yuri Milner. And it's using these two large radio telescopes and also several smaller ones to listen for ET signals. Uh, and I should mention the one on the left, Green Bank Telescope uh, in West Virginia, is a very short distance from a spruce knob where Novak hosts its uh, almost heaven star party. In fact, I took this photo during one of my uh, visits uh, to the almost heaven star party. So for those of you who are going to almost heaven one of these upcoming years, you can get a tour to go to Green Bank. And I really highly encourage that you take that tour. I also took the photo on the right of the Parkes Observatory in Australia. Um, so these are the two main telescopes that Breakthrough Listen is using to uh, try to find a signal from ET. Uh, and these, si these searches are becoming increasingly sophisticated because they now have advanced radio receivers that can sift through millions of narrowband channels simultaneously, meaning we don't have to try to guess the frequency that the aliens are using for their transmission. And the artificial intelligence we're using is getting better and better at filtering out human radio noise, making these searches more efficient. So if there are large numbers of radio transmitting civilizations out there in our galaxy, you know, one of these days, you know, Breakthrough Listen or another city, SETI project might hit the ultimate jackpot.
But I really want to make this clear. Radio is not the only way to do SETI. There are several other groups, including a sister group called Breakthrough SETI, that are searching for powerful pulsed laser signals transmitted by other civilizations. This is a field known as optical SETI. The leading group right now is led by Shelley Wright, who we see here at the upper left. She's an astronomer at the University of California at San Diego. Uh, their group is known as Pano SETI, and they're planning to build four observatories, two each in the northern and southern hemispheres. <clears throat> you can see an artist's rendering of one of their observatories. It's going to have 88 a dome with 88 wide field telescopes designed to cover an extremely wide field of view. So the goal here is to survey the entire sky for pulsed you know, uh, laser signals that last less than a billionth of a second, which would be a clear sign of artificial origin. But, I, and I, I will make this bet, and I already have actually, if we discover extraterrestrial intelligence, I predict it will not be through a SETI project. It'll instead be, you know, the, the SETI projects like optical and radio SETI are assuming that there are other civilizations out there that are purposefully trying to call attention to themselves by sending out signals that other advanced civilizations could detect. But what about maybe the vast majority of civilizations that are not actively trying to signal us or other civilizations. So I want you to, uh, you know, I, I want, want to just mention that I'm putting my money on what I would call a serendipitous discovery of a techno signature. So I want you to consider the eight different objects or phenomenon shown in this slide. The one thing they have in common is all of them were discovered by astronomers who were, were not trying to find them. They were discovered by serendipity when an observing technique or technology crossed a threshold and allowed these phenomenon like sunspots and rings all the way to gamma ray bursts and pulsars to come into view. So my point of th is this, the history of astronomy tells us that it's quite possible and perhaps likely that the discovery of an extraterrestrial civilization will be the a result of serendipity enabled by our improved technology. Now I'm basing this uh, prediction on several premises, but I consider all of them very, very reasonable. And I think all of you will as well. First, I'm presuming that it's possible that the evolution of life on other planets in our galaxy has already produced civilizations that have gone on to develop technology. It happened here on Earth. It could have happened elsewhere. The first life-bearing planets could have uh, formed billions of years before Earth. So it's possible there are civilizations out there that arose millions or even billions of years ago. Second, I think some of those civilizations will survive their technological uh, adolescence, meaning they won't blow themselves up in nuclear war or destroy their planet's ability to support advanced life as we seem to be doing right now. Uh, third, some of those civilizations then will go on to develop technology way beyond our current level. And this could be facilitated by artificial intelligence. So just think, you know, just go back a few hundred years ago, like when the pilgrims landed in Massachusetts, that was 400 years ago. And look how much technology and our, how our understanding of the universe has improved in just 400 years. We'll then try to extrapolate that to a civilization that's been around millions or billions of years into the future. So, you know, I don't think, you know, my fourth premise is that such civilizations are just going to sit around on their home planet sending out radio waves. They're, they're going to develop interstellar travel and they're going to explore the universe around them 
and take advantage of the vast resources in interstellar space. So I want you to just consider for a moment a civilization millions of years ahead of us. It has vast stretches of time at its disposal and it would have technology that would appear magical to us, just as like your cell phone would, would get you burned at the stake by the Puritans in New England. They would think like, that's impossible. You're, you know, this is the devil. These civilizations would have mind boggling technology. Like for example, this art shows a colony orbiting a black hole that's tapping the energy of the material swirling into, the, into a black hole. Now we're nowhere close to being able to do that. I mean, we wanna get as far away as possible from a black hole, but you know, for maybe a civilization that was around a billion years ago, this might be something that they'd want to do and would be relatively easy to do, just as like you could get on a jet plane and fly from Dulles Airport to Los Angeles in like four or five hours. So I'm just, you know, my point here is that there could be civilizations with very advanced astro engineering projects that we could possibly detect some manifestation of their of their advanced technology and their advanced uh, engineering, and that would be a techno signature. So there's a number of ways that astronomers could discover the techno signature of another civilization. For example, just a few minutes ago, I showed you the slide of ExoLife Finder. Now it could detect uh, the team. One of the team members, Jeff Kuhn, told me that it could detect the spectral signature of artificially produced gases such as chlorofluorocarbons in the atmospheres of nearby exoplanets. Now, if that doesn't excite you, it could even take with infrared imaging, it could image cities on the night side of nearby exoplanets. And here's, I just love this space art depicting what an alien city might look like. Uh, so who knows, you know, what one of these things would look like. Another possibility, I'm sure many of you have heard of this term. In 1960, the British American physicist Freeman Dyson, who died just about a year ago, he populari popularized the idea that a highly advanced civilization could build a spherical swarm of space colonies around its star to harvest some or most of its radiant energy. Uh, this art depicts what one of the Dyson spheres might look like. Uh, such a me megastructure would radiate heat, which astronomers could detect in the infrared part of the spectrum. Astronomers have actually studied infrared survey data of stars and entire galaxies to see if they could find signs of Dyson spheres or other megastructures in space. And this is just one of many proposed techno signatures that we could detect with current or near future telescopes. And we might not even have to look deep into space to find evidence of another civilization. For example, Penn State University astronomer Jason Wright has pointed out that we can't rule out the possibility that advanced civilizations have sent probes to our solar system. We would be completely unaware of them because we have barely begun to explore our solar system. So in the book and movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, Arthur C. Clarke envisioned a future lunar colonists discovering an artificial, mo artificial monolith buried by another civilization just below the lunar surface, no, they would know that we would someday find it. So if we start observing other planets and moons or even explore our Earth better with more detail, who knows what we, could, what we might find. And as Jason Wright points out, we cannot in any way rule out that there could be active or derelict alien probes orbiting the sun and given you know studying earth and given the vastness of interplanet interplanet interplanetary space we'd have very little chance of ever finding them 
And that brings me to the subject of UFOs or UAPs, as they are called by government and military officials. Now, as I discussed with uh, Paul and George a few days ago, I have considerable trepidation about raising this uh, controversial topic because I know people have very strong opinions on this topic. Uh, whereas I'm trying to be more nuanced, but I do feel like I need to discuss this topic briefly because they've been in the news a lot recently, especially after the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released its report to the public on June 25th. And there was also a classified report given to Congress. Uh, whoops, I meant to go back. So some people, uh, including reputable scientists uh, cite UFOs as compelling evidence that Earth is being visited by extraterrestrials <clears throat> right now. But then there are skeptics who say that all UFOs are hoaxes, illusions, or misidentifications of natural or human phenomenon. And I have to be honest, I sort of vacillate between these two extreme positions. I have been a skeptic most of my life, but for, for decades, a small percentage of UFO encounters have defied easy explanations. And I find the US Navy encounters in recent years to be particularly compelling because they involve you know, videos, there's even some still images, and there's also radar tracking of, of strange objects, and I would also say credible eyewitness testimony, both from the radar operators and some of our very best naval pilots. So there's been prosaic explanations put forth by skeptics such as Mick West and Robert Schaefer. I find their explanations to be very, very non-compelling to me. Like you can explain the videos, but not the fact that the pilots are shouting about amazing things they're seeing as they're taking the video and they're being scrambled after they get these really unusual radar detections. So to me, and this is consistent on, I've read the government report several times, the government report is basically saying there's a number of these encounters. We don't know what it is that we're, we're seeing, what the Navy pilots are seeing. If the skeptics had a really compelling explanation that accounted for all of these sightings, that would have been in the government report, but it's not. So I, I actually do not agree with the skeptics on with their explanations, although I give them credit for trying very hard to come up with prosaic explanations. But I will also add, as the government report says, we don't have like proof that Earth is being visited by extraterrestrials. And I think that the people who believe that these are extra or non-human intelligence, they ultimately have the burden of proof, not the skeptics. So like the government report, I haven't drawn any firm conclusions uh, on what it is that these Navy encounters represent. I remain mystified. Um, I think it remains to be seen whether studying UFOs will ever produce concrete evidence that non-human intelligence is visiting Earth, I just don't know. I, don't, I certainly don't think we should stop, you know, that we should stop looking for techno signatures and doing SETI. My argument is, as the government report implies, we need to destigmatize the topic of UFOs and encourage more scientists to get involved but not at the expense of these other things that I've been discussing tonight. So I just want to conclude by saying, however it comes about, a conclusive discovery of another civilization, I think would be a major event for humanity. If the civilization is far more advanced, which is highly probable, it would give us reason for optimism that relatively primitive civilizations like our own can survive technological adolescence. And it might even answer the question of whether humans have a post-biological future where we merge with machines 
or per, you know or produce artificial intelligence that takes our place and confirming the existence of another civilization would have i think profound ramifications in ways we cannot predict especially if we can obtain some detailed information and even detecting more primitive extraterrestrial life would be fascinating it would give us insight into the origins and types of planets and environments that can support life and what kinds of alternative life forms might be possible that might be very different from terrestrial life. And, and, and even if we were to go, let's say, go decades and decades and not find any evidence at all of extraterrestrial life, even that would be maybe disappointing, but it would be interesting because it would imply that something very rare and unusual happened on Earth and might give us more motivation to take care of the life here on our own planet. So in my view, no matter what we find or don't find, the search for life on other worlds will tell us a lot about ourselves and our place in this wondrous universe. So I want to thank all of you for listening in tonight. Here are four books that I very highly recommend. I should point out that the book on the left involves professors at George Mason University, and it's a wonderful book. Uh, the, uh, David Grinspoon, he's also based in Washington at the Library of Congress. And the two books on the right are uh, auth written by British authors. These are all really, really good books, and I highly recommend all of them. So thank you all very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. And I guess I should now stop my screen share. Well, you can, you can even keep it if you want, because... Uh... You might have to go back to some slides. Thank, thank okay, you. Sure. Thanks. That was awesome. Um, really cool to think of all the possibilities. I like your slide on the three different uh, tracks that you know we take and trying to think through these things. Um, you know, I, you know, going back to just for just my quick question is back to the solar system, and I think it's, uh, I think it's really great and satisfying that we have some missions coming up that might might help with that. The ESA probe uh, or, or rover to, to mm -hmm. Mars digging deep and so forth. Uh, you know, why do you think, why do you think NASA hasn't put, you know, the, the sensor suite that, um, you know, we, we really, I won't say definitively, but, you know, would, would bring us a lot closer to being able to detect what the microbial signatures would be. Why, why have we kind of maybe lost that? Okay. And that, that's a great, great question, Paul. My understanding from you know, when I was working at Astronomy and Sky and Telescope and really covering these Mars missions is NASA years ago after, I think they were kind of spooked by the somewhat ambiguous results from Viking that, you know, it kind of gave the, the biology, the whole suite of the biology and the, uh, the experiment to detect organic molecules gave kind of ambiguous results. And NASA did not want to repeat that. So NASA decided decades ago to really concentrate not on finding life, but to study Mars's current and especially past ability to support life. So it developed what was known as the follow the water strategy, where it would look for you know, signs of ancient rocks that formed in liquid water. I would argue, you know, and you could get a planetary scientist who would very strongly disagree with me, but I know there's some who agree with me that, you know, really spirit and opportunity around, you know, in their early explorations of Mars, you know, 2004, 2005, you know, found all sorts of clays and other mineral signatures of rocks and material that had to have formed in water. And of course, you know, the orbiter photos just scream out, you know, liquid water was here. I mean, the whole northern hemisphere might have been a large ocean, you know, billions of years ago. So in my mind, that question was resolved like 20, almost 20 years ago. I will, I, you know, I'm going to tell a little joke here. Now, scientists might not find this funny, but I would go to scientific conferences and other science journalists and I would go around kind of joking, how many times is NASA going to claim 
that it's discovered water on Mars, you know, ancient, that there was ancient water on Mars. And it just seems like every few years, NASA goes, we've discovered that NASA had water on Mars. Well, I would argue, you could even argue it discovered it back in the 1970s with Mariner 9 and then Viking 1 and 2 orbiters. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm not the only one who thinks this, but I, if there's a planetary scientists who are on this call, they can argue, you know, they can maybe come up with valid car counter arguments. But I would argue that NASA has maybe been a little too conservative in its instrument packages that it sent to Mars, not wanting to replicate the ambiguous and controversial results of the Viking biology experiments. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Let's see. We do have some questions, and I want to get to all of them if we can. Um, hold you there. Uh, how, how's the weather in Pennsylvania? Are you you're all right? <laughs> I think it's all right right now. It's it's okay. dark out now, so I, I'm looking out my window and can't really tell if a storm is coming. <laughs> okay. Hey, I think it's George Stall. Is it Stallings, George? I just see George S. But I want to circle back to a question you had. Um, Yes, it's Stallings. Hey, George. How are you doing? Hey. Why don't you ask your question? Uh, yes. So um, the uh, one thing I was thinking is the sensitivity of the new telescopes and their ability to uh, detect trace biosignatures on particularly exoplanets. I was just wondering if we know for certain that they have the sensitivity to be able to do that. Um, That's because of the difficulties we've had, you know, even in situ and yeah. on Mars and, and with phosphine on Venus. Yeah, that, 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 that's, a, that's another great question, George. So that, that you, you raised it just right. The phosphine and the methane and the oxygen, you know, phosphine on Venus, oxygen and methane on Mars. And, you know, the, the, the oxygen and methane detections are very secure detections. I mean they're there you know the, the you know they're definitely there phosphine my guess is there's a little bit of phosphine but you're absolutely right i mean we're, we're detecting these compounds that could indicate life but they're not really proof of life and it does get dicey there are some uh, let me first talk about james webb when i wrote that astronomy article i interviewed several different astronomers some of whom said that yes, there are possible. It is possible that James Webb could detect biosignatures in some of the closest known transiting exoplanets that are in or near the habitable zone. There's actually one star called Trappist Nine, I believe it's called, that has three planets in the habitable zone. That tr there's like seven planets that transit. Three of them are in the, tr the habitable zone. So that'll be a prime target. But there's other astronomers who, th who say we think that it's just beyond James Webb's reach, that we would need a bigger telescope to really detect convincing you know, biosignatures. But from what I was told by a number of astronomers, they think those ground-based telescopes with their giant mirrors and they actually have better instruments than Webb has, like because they, you know, Webb can't be serviced by astronauts. So you build instruments, put them on Webb, and those are the instruments you're stuck with. Well, those spectrometers were built a number of years ago. The spectrometers that are going to be put on these giant telescopes are like being built right now. So they're going to have better technology. And, you know, they're going to be on bigger telescopes with giant apertures that are going to be, you know, places that are good for ground-based astronomy. So from what I was told, and maybe not all astronomers agree, if life is fairly common, where maybe like one out of every five or one out of ten planetary systems has a life-bearing planet, these three ground-based telescopes give up, should give us some indications of life-bearing planets. And probably what will happen is the first one or two planets, they're going to say, well, we found oxygen and we maybe found water vapor. 
but it'll be maybe somewhat inconclusive. But what if you start finding like a whole bunch of planets and they all kind of have similarities to Earth or other combinations of chemicals that would be really, really difficult to explain by not, you know, non-biologically. So I, it'll, I think it'll be a case where it won't, it, it probably won't be one planet. Oh, that one planet has life. They'll need to get the spectrum of a number of different planets and start seeing patterns or certain characteristics, you know, maybe and how they line up with the planet size, distance from the star, et cetera. I think it might not be like a deja vu or eureka moment. It might be something that an understanding of the biological potential of planets builds up over a number of years. I think that's actually the more likely scenario, but all of these telescopes are gonna come online this decade. So it could be that 10 years from now, you know, we've really started to get strong indications that there are other planets within maybe a few dozen light years of Earth that are supporting life, or it might be like Mars and Venus, remains controversial and uncertain. We'll just have to wait and see what they find. But great question. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, George. Uh, let's see, David, maybe David Worth, if you're still on, you may have touched on this, but if you want to ask your question. Yeah, sorry if there's redundancy, but a really interesting presentation, Robert. Um, it just seems to me that uh, in the search for exoplanets, moons kind of get uh, less uh, love. Uh, obviously, yeah. but I'm just wondering from uh, the, the slides you had about the next-gen grounded space-based telescopes, will any of them have the ability to detect moons around exoplanets? You know, that, that's, you know that's a very good question. And to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, as of now, we have yet to detect a single confirmed moon orbiting an exoplanet my understanding is that there are several good candidates where you can see what are known as transit timing variations where the orbit of the plant of the moon let's say you have like a fairly massive moon orbiting a planet that'll yank on the planet in a way that'll cause the planet to transit its star a little bit early on some passages of the star and other times a little bit late. And my understanding is that we're starting to see some indications, but the planets themselves are gonna be really hard to study. It's sort of like that problem I mentioned earlier, the million to one, you know, the plant, the star will outshine the planet by like a million to one. Like the analogy, and maybe I should have mentioned this during the talk, is it's like having a blazing searchlight and then you take like a little pathetic little birthday candle and you hold it right next to the blazing searchlight. And then like you're 10 miles away and you're looking at the blazing searchlight with binoculars or a telescope and you're trying to see the, uh, the little light from the birthday candle. Like that is a really, really hard problem technologically. So... <clears throat> You know, I'm not sure, it might depend on what kind of moons are out there. Like if you had a really big, like Earth-sized moon orbiting, you know, maybe a planet, maybe a few times the mass of Earth, you know, kind of like a binary planet, you know, I'm just speculating here. Um, something like that might be observable, but it, it'll, I mean, just studying the planets alone is gonna be really, really hard uh, so I'm not sure what kind of potential these telescopes will be for finding life on moons, but your point is very, very well taken. <clears throat> and for example, in the movie Avatar, you know, this life-bearing planet, uh, what's it called? Pandora is a moon orbiting a gas giant. And by no means should we exclude moons as possible abodes for life. It just is they're going to be really, really hard to study from afar. So I would guess if we discover life on a moon, it'll be like Europa, Titan, or Enceladus in our own solar system. But who knows? That's a great question, too. 
That's Thank one you. reason, by the way, I like giving these talks is I get really, really great questions and I can tell how well informed and interested amateur astronomers are in this topic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Rob Parks, if you're on still, uh, you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm of the sort of the Adam Frank side of things, and, and I personally think that uh, extraterrestri intelligent extraterrestrial life is actually exceedingly rare, primarily because of the Fermi paradox. Uh, given um, just how, frankly, easy it would be to colonize the entire galaxy using uh, self-replicating machines, which we're getting to the point of doing now, like creating self-replicating machines. What is your answer to the fact that we have yet to detect uh, any sort of, not only uh, extraterrestrial or intelligent life, but any life at all? Right. Yeah, no, and that's another great question. I, I should point out, by the way, two, two things before I get to the substance of your question. Number one, I used to edit Adam Frank's articles for Astronomy Magazine. So I've worked with Adam Frank. He's a really nice guy very talented writer. At the time, he was studying things like planetary nebula and supernova, like to try to model the morphology of, you know, like why the ring nebula or the cat's eye nebula has its shape or the homunculus nebula or like supernova remnants. So I was, I'm sort of find it interesting that later in his career, he did like a major sh turn in his research to go into astrobiology. The <laughs> second thing, you can go back to the July 1996 issue of Astronomy Magazine. In fact, I could even email it to you after the talk. Um, I wrote an article called, OK, Where Are They? Where I took very much that perspective that, you know, you know intelligent life is fairly uncommon we might be the only one in, in the galaxy and i guess you know I, I, the sort of thing with this talk is and you'll notice i didn't really talk about the drake equation or whether i thought intelligent life or light life is common i would just say we just i've come i've sort of changed my thinking over the years to where i would just say we just don't know uh, and that's why we we don't know what's out there. So we just need to try to observe and explore and use the best technology and tools at our disposal. And as I said, I'm really encouraged that we have lots of different ways now to try to find life out you know, beyond Earth. And we should try as many different ideas and strategies as we can because we just don't know. And as for the Fermi paradox, this book on the right by Stephen Webb, great book. I actually read an earlier rendition of it in which he had 50 solutions to the Fermi paradox. Well, now he has 75. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's a lot of these solutions involve scenarios where there could be a lot of civilizations in our galaxy. Maybe they're just not interested in, you know, going out into space or making themselves known. You can, you know, use things like, um, you know, the Star Trek Prime Directive, like, you know, I mean, I would just imagine, like, let's say hundreds of years from now, we send a spacecraft, either artificial intelligence or the human crew, and we find a planet with a primitive, let's say, civilization at, let's say, the level of the Roman Empire, we probably wouldn't want to make contact, at least not initially. We would want to observe it and try to learn, you know, about a kindred civilization without really trying to interact with it or trying to disrupt its, uh, you know, disrupt, disrupt its natural evolution. So I, I'm not saying that Adam is wrong. I'm just saying that we just don't, I, I would just disagree in the sense that we just don't know who or what is out there, what their capabilities are, what their motivations are. So we just, I just think we need to keep an open mind, like with Stephen Webb with 75 different possibilities and just kind of be aware that we're sort of at the very beginning of really trying to understand our place in, in the galaxy. 
Um, so I just like I just plead. We just don't know. Let's do what we can to find out and not try to think we know the answer. Let's try to find the answer without preconceptions. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. And, and yeah. excellent talk, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And Rob, that, do, you know the book, do you know the book there on the left? That was, What's that? Uh, I was asking Rob if he's familiar with the book there. Yeah. I, met, I guess right. imagine. That's a great book. Oh, Roger. imagine life. That yes. Book. Yes. I love that book because it, it talks about, you know, life, planets with life, kind of like Earth, similar biochemistry. Then it has like planets with life that are really different, like, for example, silicon life, but life that's still kind of cell based or, you know, stuff like that. Then it gets on to speculative life that's really, really different, like, you know, interstellar clouds or, you know, just life that's like totally radically different than anything we have on earth. And so the book really covered a wide gamut of possibilities. Uh, and, you know, they're very good writers. So uh, I thought that was a really, really good book. So I can't, I can't recommend that book highly enough. I mean, I read that book before I wrote the article for astronomy because it really kind of broadened my thinking on this topic. Okay, we'll go to Richard, Richard Hayden. Hello, um, maybe following on a little bit from the prior question. Um, I think the common consensus is that life on Earth came from one single, single-celled organism a long time ago. Is there any thought on why life did not evolve multiple times? Um, or, you know, or do, do people in fact believe that uh, there could have been multiple single cell organisms in different places? Th that's that. Well, I'm, I'm getting great questions from this club. I expected I would, but it's great. OK, so I am not. This is sort of outside my field of specialty. But based on what I have read and, you know, some interviews I've done over the years that all life on Earth appears to have like a common origin because it's all kind of the same basic biochemistry. There's certain, you know, it all uses DNA and RNA. There's certain common, there's a certain commonality of all life on earth that points to a singular origin. However, I know there was an article a few years ago in Scientific American, a great article. I don't remember what month and year it was, but there are actually biologists right now who are looking in different types of environments to find life that might not be related to other Earth life that might have had from a different origin of life, like a second genesis of life on Earth. Uh, so there are actually people who are looking for alternate life forms right here on Earth. Of course, that would be the easiest to find because it's right here on our planet. I also, my understanding is that the most primitive organisms on Earth are thermophiles, like you, what you see like around hot springs and black smokers in the ocean, which might imply that, you know, the first life originated around a hydrothermal vent in one of Earth's early oceans. Or another idea is that the origin of life actually goes back even earlier in Earth's history, prior to the late heavy bombardment, where maybe life originated like over 4 billion years ago, and that Earth went through a period where it was getting pummeled by huge impactors, the ones that formed, you know, the large basins on the moon, the impact basins on the moon, like the Sea of Tranquility, and that those impactors like heated up the Earth and, you know, almost completely sterilized the Earth. But the thermophiles, which can tolerate high temperatures, were able to survive the bombardment so when the late heavy bombardment ended, you know, they were the only living organisms that could survive that so that all life that exists today, you know, survive, you know, as descendants of those early thermophiles. I mean, I don't think that's at all proven, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Uh, and then there's the idea that maybe other life has evolved on Earth, but maybe just was outcompeted 
and did not manage to survive. And maybe we don't have fossil evidence for it, or maybe the fossils that it left behind, we couldn't distinguish from, you know, fossils from the life of, you know, the type of life that we're familiar with. So I think the answer to your question is we just don't know. Uh, but there's several different guesses as to what that answer might be. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Jonathan Cross, you've had your hand up for uh, <laughs> probably 10, 15 minutes or maybe longer. I don't know, but uh, uh, your time is now. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, Robert, terrific yeah. presentation. Can you hear me okay? It, yep. <clears throat> My question is, uh, I, I read um, Dr. Um, uh, Ari Loeb's book recently. Okay, yep. I forget what it's called. It was absolutely fascinating to me, and, and I was surprised that I never heard it in 2017 about this cigar-shaped yep. mysterious object that floated by. Oumuamua. But, <laughs> but uh, Uma Wuma, I think. Uh, and I wondered, uh, what are your views on that? Do you, I mean, when you read his book, I mean, it's hilarious. He's a tenured, you know, Harvard uh, astrophysicist. And he said he, he would never have written the book unless he had tenure, <laughs> <laughs> and, which is great and probably, I'm sure, true. Um, what are your thoughts about this this phenomena? And, you know, it, it's changed or, you know, it changed directions. And it's there's some things about it that if it is a comet, if it is an asteroid or some weird thing, how could it have done that? OK, so, no. And I'm really, really glad you asked that question. Thank you. Um, I, I thought about including that in my presentation, but I didn't want to kind of get sidestepped and because then it would make, you know, I'd have to take something else out or the presentation gets too long. So I and, and, and other people, when I've given this talk to other clubs, have asked it, you know, maybe a little bit differently than you did. But I've been asked this question before. OK, so I'm going to give you my opinion on this, but my opinion would be the opinion of probably 99% of scientists who, astronomers and scientists who study the solar system. And that is that his idea that Oumuamua is an alien artificially produced object is bunk. And I can tell you why. And I'm, the per I'm a good person to ask this question. And I can, this is another article when I worked at Astronomy Magazine uh, I was at a planetary science conference in Boulder, Colorado, sometime in 1996, and I met a very brilliant young scientist who all of you have heard of named Alan Stern. Now, he co-authored a book recently with David Grinspoon, who's on my slide here. So Alan Stern later became the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. He is a great scientist, one of the great astronomers and planetary scientists of our era. He is brilliant. He is utterly brilliant. And he told me this idea at the, bull this is kind of a long-winded answer, but I really want to give a complete answer to your very good question. He told me that sooner or later, we're going to find an interstellar comet. And I'm like, what the hell is an interstellar comet? And he said it's an object that was tossed out of its own planetary system after encountering a giant planet early in its system's history, was cast out into the galaxy, and that it's roaming the galaxy and eventually comes close to the sun and eventually will find one of these things. He told me there are like trillions upon trillions of these objects floating around the Milky Way galaxy. So I asked him, I go, well, you know, I'm, edit I'm an editor at Astronomy Magazine. We would really like you to write an article for Astronomy Magazine about this. And he said, I'd love to. So he wrote a great article that I had the privilege of editing. And it ran in the, Fe I think it was the February 1997 issue of Astronomy Magazine. I have it on my computer after the talk, I can email it maybe to uh, to Paul, and he can send it out to people who are Thank interested. You. This is so long ago that I don't feel guilty about it. Well, he, he predicted in the article, he said, because of the solar system's 
motion through, you know, our orbital motion around the center of the galaxy, he said that the average object is going to come from kind of the direction of Lyra, because that's the direction that we're orbiting the center of the Milky Way. We're like heading toward Lyra. So it's like a car going down the highway and accumulating bugs on the windshield. You can get hit from different directions, but most of the bugs are going to hit your windshield. Okay, and that's why like you drive a long distance, you get a lot of bugs on your windshield, but you, you'll still get a few elsewhere, but most will be your windshield. And he said the average velocity would be 20 to 30,000 kilometers. Was it a second or per hour? I should know. I should remember that. In any event, he predicted a velocity. Well, Oumuamua came from within like a couple degrees of the prediction of Alan Stern. Ah. And it came in at 25,000 kilometers an hour or whatever it was, right in the middle of his range. And Alan said, well, it'll take about 20 years till we find one of these things. Well, he, he this article appeared in 1997 and it was found in 2017, 20 years later. So you, I, I can send Alan's article and anyone who wants to read it can read it. And, you know, these things were expected. Uh, there should and we're going to find like when the Vera Rubin telescope is online, Pardon my bad language, but it's going to find a shitload of these things because they're constantly coming into the solar system. Most never get close enough to the sun where they're easily visible. But like I guarantee you, there's a number of these objects in the solar system right now. But if they don't come close to the sun, they're not illuminated enough that we could ever detect them. Now, yes, Oumuamua did when it was observed by Hubble as it was leaving the solar system was a little bit off of its project predicted trajectory because of a non-gravitational acceleration. Now, Avi Loeb is attributing that to like a light sail that it was deliberately constructed. However, um, there are all sorts of reasons, ways to get around that. Uh, where it was venting gas while it was rounding the sun. Wow. We only got good observations of it for about a week. So like it, when we observed it, it doesn't didn't look like it was venting gas when we observed it, but that we only caught a tiny part of its arc through the solar system. So it could have been venting gas after we observed it, like it got warmed up by the sun, Eventually, some of its surface, you know, the gas, you know, the the, va the volatile material below its surface eventually got exposed to space and started venting at a time when we weren't really able to get good observations of this object. Uh, there's also other people have proposed different like compositions that have could have accounted for this. That would be, you know, high, you know, very natural compositions for an interstellar object. So. You know, my view of the book is that if Avi Loeb had not included Oumuamua in his book and with his claim that it's an artificial object, my guess is not a lot of a lot fewer people would have read his book. I mean, maybe that wasn't his motivation. He probably really does believe it. But I think, you know, my understanding and I've actually talked to Alan Stern about this like a year ago when this first came out is all the observables of Oumuamua can be fairly trivially explained by purely natural materials and processes without any need to resort to, you know, alien technology. And I would say that's what I have, what's in common with UFOs. Like you need really, really good evidence, I think, to really make the claim a strong claim that you're seeing alien technology. So with Oumuamua, when there's so many ways to explain it without invoking technology, then I think, you know, that hypothesis is just not really worthy of serious consideration. That's my opinion, but you know, there, and I should also point out Avi Loeb is not a planetary scientist. He's really a cosmologist. Oh. He's outside of his field. 
he's outside of his field of astronomy when he makes that up. I mean, he's done calculations, but this is not his field of, of research. So I, I very strongly disagree with him. Now, he's a lot smarter than me, but there's people who are also a lot smarter than me who are as smart or smarter than he is and who actually specialize in planetary science and have actually made major discoveries and led missions in planetary science who disagree with him. And I take their opinion much more seriously than I would take Avi Loeb's opinion. Thank you. Very, yep. very uh, much appreciated. Yep. Hey, Sorry, uh, it was John, a little long-winded, but yeah. I wanted to get that across. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jonathan, I put a, uh, a link to the briefing we had last month. We had Dr. Summers talk about that object for the for the Novak general meeting. So you could, you could click on that link and, and hopefully it takes you to the uh, oh, mua, mua talk that he gave. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. And, and, and I'll be Thank happy you. to eat. And I'll be happy after the talk. I will email that Alan Stern article from 1997. Okay. I'll send it to Paul. It's, it's a really good article. And like I had never heard of this before. And by getting to edit that article, I became really interested. And I should point out when Oumuamua was discovered in 2017, I wrote a web news article for astronomy.com in which I talked about the discovery in the context of Alan Stern's article and how accurate his predictions were on, on its direction, like how long it would take to find one, its velocity. I mean, he nailed. It's pretty amazing. That tells you something about how smart the guy is. He nailed it 20 years ahead of time. <laughs> that is cool. Yeah, we had a good brief on that last month, yeah. and I uh, didn't talk about that as much, but it gave you, uh, it talked a lot about the uh, different oddities of that object. There's like four or five things that just make no sense at all on, uh, you know, that are attached to that object. And so it was a good brief. If folks want to look back at that, it's on the YouTube. Yeah, because I'd like to watch that myself. Then. Yeah, um, so you should be able to get this chat or I can reply to you. Uh, Okay. Not to, and, uh, Robert. and when you said D my, Dr. Summers, is that Michael Summers? Who yeah. Wrote him? Okay, great. Yep. All yep. the better. Yeah, I'd love to see his talk. Yeah, he gave a good good show okay. on Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. As long as uh, yeah. Robert is good, we're going to press uh, a little bit further. Uh, not too many more. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael Robbins. Hello, Robert. Uh, Hi. I just had a quick question. In one of your charts... You should. Well, it was right after the chart that you had on the thirty meter telescope and the extremely large telescope. Uh, and you showed a, an interesting uh, exoplanet telescope that I, I've never oh, seen oh, before. Oh, Exo Life Finder. Yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah. Well, can you explain what the principle of that one is and and why it doesn't have? It doesn't appear to have uh, <laughs> the, a, a typical configuration with with the the mirrors. Okay, great question. I'm not an expert on this, but what this is, is it's an optical interferometer. So what it is, is it's optimized for extremely high angular resolution. So imagine like, I'm sure all of you have heard of the very large array in New Mexico, uh, which is an, a radio inter interferometer, or it's even like the Event Horizon Telescope, which has like a telescope that uses the size of the earth to achieve very high angular resolution. So what the ExoLife Finder is, is it's basically taking smaller mirrors, but putting them far apart. And remember at optical wavelengths, it's a shorter wavelength. So you don't, you know, it, it's it, because it's a shorter wavelength that some respects it's easier to get higher resolution than radio where you're dealing with long wavelengths. So ExoLife Finder is designed for very high angular resolution by using optical interferometry, but in combination, and this is something I don't fully understand how it works. Jeff Kuhn tried to explain it to me. I don't fully understand it. But it's basically by controlling the wave fronts of the waves at each individual mirror, there, there, there's a way you can cancel it out. So you cancel out the light of the star 
So there's a planet that's maybe just, you know, a tiny distance away, like a fraction of an arc second away. You can see the star, the planet, the feeble, incredibly faint light of the planet without the star there. And with the high angular resolution, you can then start getting really good observations of the planet without it being contaminated. You know, because of the uh, coronagraph, you're not the light of the planet is not going to be contaminated by the light of the star. So this is a big technological challenge to build a telescope that's capable of doing this. The idea is they're going to build a prototype smaller telescope in the Canary Islands. I'm not sure where they are right now in that project because, you know, I, I interviewed them. It would have been over a year ago that I wrote the article. So I don't know where they are in the project. But the idea is to do a prototype telescope to test the technology, both with the interferometry and the coronagraph. And then if they get back to work, then they can go to different funding sources, you know, foundations, governments, whatever, and get the money to build the really big telescope that could really do this unbelievably cutting edge study of exoplanets. But it is very difficult technology, but, you know, technology that's within our ability to do this right now. Thank you. Uh, you said you wrote an article about that. Was, it, was that in astronomy.com? Yeah. The, uh, so the article I wrote uh, was the cover story of the September 2020 issue of Astronomy. And that one I wouldn't really want to send out because it's only a year old. I have and, it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> But uh, so I wouldn't really want to send that like the articles from years ago. I don't feel any guilt sending them out. But an article from a year ago, uh, I wouldn't want to send that out, because you know, copyright issues, et cetera. Thank you. Yep. Hey, thanks, Michael. And uh, I would just go to their website, their website, ExoLife Finder. And the guy's name, his name is Jeff, J-E-F-F, Kuhn, K-U-H-N, University of Hawaii. I think he has some popular talks. You could go to YouTube and listen to one of his talks about it. All right. I think we have like two more. I think Alvin's dialed off. So I'm going to okay. try to try to tackle his, uh, at least give you his question was basically, uh, you know, we all look for life in terms of our own definition, carbon based, etc. Um, what can you talk, can you say anything about, you know, what we're doing about looking for other forms of light, light, a life that doesn't reflect light or dark matter based, silicon based, et cetera. That, that's a great question. That that's one where the, uh, the imagined life book that I'm referencing here really, you know, really did a great job of, um, you know, of really discussing really weird forms of life. Uh, as I said, I really I, I should reread that book because it, it wasn't just interesting. It was a really fun read as well. I like the way they put that book together. Um, you know, most of what I was talking about tonight was really looking for kind of life as we know it. Uh, but the thought is if and there's another book that just came out by a British zoologist that I don't agree with because it argued, what was the title? I can't remember, I, I could get it later, but it argues that like all life out there is gonna be kind of like earth life. I don't agree with that. I think we really don't, we, we can't answer that question right now. I think with these exoplanet studies, um, there's a potential, like we could find, let's say a planet that's, let's say too hot or too cold for terrestrial life, and yet you might find a spectral signature, you know, a biosignature that looks really different from life, what we have here on Earth, that might give you something that's really anomalous. And maybe if you see that a similar signature on a couple other planets, that would indicate something really weird, you know, some kind of life very different from terrestrial life in the solar system. Um, you know, certainly we could find something, you know, let's say uh, sample return brings back microbial life from Mars. It's really different from Earth life. 
that would be really cool. And I would love to know what's in the oceans like of Europa. The problem with Europa, it has all the ingredients for life as we know it, but it's going to be really hard to access that ocean because it might be a number of kilometers beneath a very thick icy shell, but there might be places where the water's seeping to the surface or is not far below, below the surface. That's what this NASA Europa Clipper will be designed to try to sit, you know, give us ideas of the next step of Europa exploration. So it's hard to say. I mean, if there's really alternative forms of life, it could come from Mars sample return. It could come from, um, you know, looking at the moons of the outer solar system or Venus. If there's anything in Venus's atmosphere, almost guaranteed it's a really weird form of life from our perspective or something really anomalous uh, by doing exoplanet spectroscopy or, you know, with SETI finding, you know, like let's say we find evidence of artificial life, you know, uh, you know, artificial intelligence that's the kind of life we can envision, but, you know, we haven't gotten there ourselves yet. And I would argue that would be a really weird form of life from our perspective, although one that we can at least anticipate. And by the way, I'll make one quick comment, maybe very controversial. If these UFOs that the Navy is encountering are technology, you know, non-human intelligence, and I'm not saying they are, but if they are, my guess is that they are being flown by artificial intelligence and not by biological creatures. I don't know that for a fact. That's just my uh, kind of my hunch, but I could be totally wrong. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's cool. Uh, hey, I think, uh, Robert, if we if we can give you one more question, yep. I'm not sure if Dave, Dave, uh, Salov, Salov, are you still on? I didn't see him, but uh, I didn't see him in the uh, list. Uh, he must have dropped off. But great question for for uh, a, a freelance journalist to answer as our sort of get off the stage question. All right, he's he's basically saying, "What would happen if extraterrestrial intelligence was discovered? Is there wariness about notifying others of Earth's presence, intelligent life? You know, from a reporter's perspective, what what do you think the reaction would be?" I can say from a report, that's a great, another great question. They've all been, um, from a reporter's perspective, I can't think of a more exciting story to cover. So in fact, if earlier this year, I wrote an article, uh, for astronomy.com about a possible radio SETI signal from Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the sun picked up by, um, picked up by the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. You know, that's a really fun, fascinating topic to write about. I mean, 99.9% .9 chance that signal is human radio interference. But uh, I can say from a reporter's perspective, if I found out that, um, if I found out that, um, you know, we had evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence, I would want to get that information out as soon as possible. I guess I'm going to be, I'm going to tread in very dangerous waters here. All of you could, could jump on me, but I did do an interview a few weeks ago with a highly reputable physicist who, and this guy is PhD university of Chicago, uh, had many, many papers published in the referee journals He's had um, uh, he's one of the leaders of the team searching for dark matter particles in an underground laboratory. Totally mainstream, highly reputable physicist. Well, he and his lab at a major state university in the United States were given a sheet of metal. And he sent me a picture of the metal that he was told was from a UFO crash. Um, and they did a, a, a very detailed analysis of that piece of metal. And they found like very, very anomalous isotopic ratios. They found carbon nanotubes. And this would predate the discovery 
of carbon nanotubes. Uh, they found all sorts of really anomalous things about it. So, but it's sort of like, he's like, we're, we're working with other labs to, you know, confirm this result. So like, I wouldn't want to publish a story right now about it until like another lab confirms the result. Cause right now I don't know what to make of it. Um, but sort of like that. I mean, but if it was something, you know, when, when I gave my talks and wrote my astronomy article about the Proxima Centauri signal, it was always with 99.9% .9 chance this is human radio interference. But if there was something like if this physicist, let's say a month from now, calls me and says, you know, two other labs have found the same thing we did and we're about ready to publish our paper, I would absolutely want to report that story. And I think most science journalists would absolutely like that would be the dream, you know, the dream of a career in science journalism would be, especially if you had a scoop on real proof of extraterrestrial intelligence. I think our society could handle it. Like there's people who say, well, you know, if UFOs are ET, it'll cause society to collapse. I don't think so. I think, you know, humans, unless we saw evidence of malevolent intention, I think, you know, we, people would say, this is really interesting. Let's hope they start communicating with us or tell us a little bit about more about why they're here. But I don't I don't think society would panic or collapse. And if it was, let's say, a techno signature of a civilization like a 100 light years away or a SETI signal from a star a thousand light years away, it would be big headline news for a few days. And then society, you know, and it would certainly affect us, but I don't think it would cause any kind of mass panic or riots or anything like that. I think enough people already believe in extraterrestrial intelligence that I think our civilization, I hope at least, and I think is mature enough that we can handle that discovery. Okay, well, you're well, you're certainly invited back to Novak if you want to scoop <laughs> any new material. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and I just said I'm skeptical about this. I mean, I have this guy. He let me record the conversation, and it's a really interesting conversation. And he's like, I didn't believe it until we did the lab analysis. But yeah. you know, he's like, we're you know, we want to get another lab or another couple labs to get the same result that we did before we do anything with this. So I'm still skeptical about it. And even he is to some extent. That's what makes all of this fun, yeah. exciting, yeah. and uh, yeah. super interesting. Uh, Robert, you've, you've, you now hold the record for keeping the audience the longest. Uh, oh, I, really, I, really, <laughs> I really appreciate everything uh, you gave us tonight. And the questions were great, too. Uh, yeah, absolutely. A fun topic. And uh, just, just thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll give you some virtual or applause uh, okay thank you everybody yep really appreciate it uh for the novak folks still on most of them uh rappahannock park on the 24th don't forget about uh Torney out there um that's a good uh, gig to go visit and of course uh, if you can do some outreach for us take a look at uh alvin's uh, uh emails and uh and he's got some good opportunities even this the this week to get involved so um, that's it for tonight. Thank you again, Robert. And Thank uh, you. Yep. we will uh, keep in touch, trade emails if we need to here to exchange some information. And, uh, and uh, thanks, thanks very much for everyone joining.